Welcome to Unhinged History. Today's topic is the Gardner Art Museum heist. <laughs> Let's set the scene. I came up with a little scenario. So imagine this. It is March 18th, 1990. You are in Boston, Massachusetts. You are miserable and hungover. It's a St. Patrick's Day Sunday. You roll out of bed after a night out with the boys and turn on the television. The first channel to pop up happens to be your local news channel. Headlines read, 13 pieces of artwork have been stolen from Isabella Stewart Gardner Art Museum. They're saying this is the most expensive property theft that has ever taken place in America. You think to yourself, how could this happen? Where was security? Who could have pulled this off? Where did they go? You expected answers within the next week or so, but those answers never came. And now that introduces us to our topic. Now, before I get into anything, I want to give credit first, like inspiration and credit. Well, I was inspired to do this because I know it's a sore subject, but there is a BuzzFeed Unsolved video on this. And recently, the Red Thread podcast with Moist Critical, Wendigoon, and some Australian guy named Jackson. I don't know. I love him, though. They did a podcast on it, which is really good. And they went really into depth, probably more into depth than I'm going to go. And then also a lot of the information I got was from the Gardner Museum website itself. The History Channel has a few good videos on it. There's this website called Weebly that actually has a lot of information on the crime. Oxygen.com has a lot of the theories and a lot of the research and like investigative work that journalists did was done through journalists at the Boston Globe. So I would definitely say if you're interested in this, check out a lot of the articles from the Boston Globe because their investigative team and like literally journalists just like on their own curiosity, on their own like stubbornness being like, what happened here? They were actually a lot of the reasons why a lot of these theories are as fleshed out as they are. Those are the big sources and I just wanted to say that first just for anyone who is curious about this topic in case there's anything else you want to know in the future so let's start here's my powerpoint uh let's first start with who was isabella stewart gardner so she is the founder of this museum obviously the name of the museum is her name. So she was born as Isabel Stewart on April 14th, 1840 in New York City. So she's a city girl. Her father was a linen merchant. They were raking in the dough. As you'll see, this family is uh, really wealthy and there's a lot of like, there's a lot of rich people antics in this. A lot of really bizarre rich people antics. Isabella growing up was always a very creative girl. In school, she studied art, music, dance, language, languages. I think that included like French and Italian. So she really loved the arts, really loved being creative. She loved going to shows. She loved learning as much as she could about everything creative and this would be a passion of hers for the rest of her life. So when Isabel was 16, her family actually moved to Paris for a little bit and she continued learning at a school for Americans there. And during that time, she also had other travels around Europe and she became particularly fascinated with a lot of the art she saw. Renaissance pieces were her favorite and I don't blame her. Renaissance pieces are quite beautiful. So, I mean, pretty luxurious life, pretty bougie, but she was living that life on Dutch in, like, the 1850s. Okay, Ta Taylor Swift. I think this is who Taylor Swift wanted to be. When returning to New York in 1858, I couldn't see the exact date, so I don't know if she was 17 or 18 by this time. She reconnected with a former classmate who she met at that Paris School for Americans, and this classmate invited her to her home in Boston. When visiting that classmate in Boston, the classmate introduced Isabella to her brother, who was Jack Gardner. 
I don't know if that name sounds familiar. And quickly, Jack and Isabella fell in love. It was actually very quickly from what I saw. I don't know how soon they started dating, but they were married in New York by April 10th, 1860, but they did decide to live in Boston, which was Jack's hometown. And they stayed in Boston for at least the rest of Jack's life. I think Isabella stayed there for a long time, but I don't really know where she went for the last couple years of her life. So they were trying to have children. They had their first child who was a son, but unfortunately he died from pneumonia when he was just over a year old. I think he was like five months from turning two, which is really depressing and would be really painful for anyone. And unfortunately, Isabella then suffered a miscarriage after that. And after that, she was told that she actually could not bear any more children. This was already just devastating. And around the same time, I think afterwards, but very close, she also lost a close friend and her sister-in-law. They both passed away shortly after all this happened. So understandably, Isabella became like really depressed and ill to the point where she like had trouble moving, honestly. I saw a lot of things that she was like, she had to be taken on a stretcher a lot of places. But for some reason, they took her to the doctor and the doctor was like, you know what? what you know what i think would fix her i think a trip to europe would fix all of this i'm sorry yeah i prescribe europe so isabella was taken to europe i remind you they took a boat this is they had to take a boat there was no airplanes this was on a boat she was on a stretcher on a boat how miserable does that sound but they made their way to europe via the boat to hopefully ease Isabella's mind and make her feel better after going through all this I mean, that would be hard for anyone to go through. A lot of this, I'm like, oh, she was rich. I don't feel that bad for her, but that does suck to lose two children that you really wanted and then also just so much loss so fast. Like, it sucks. It sucks. So despite this trip being a very bizarre thing for a doctor to order, it actually worked. Like, this actually was, like, what she needed. So this trip inspired many of the hobbies and personality traits Isabella would become known for. Like, she became became like a socialite, she was like life of the party, she really became rich, eccentric girl. She would later become known as like an eccentric heiress, philanthropist, basically just like standard like old rich type of thing. So when all of the trips that Jack and Isabella took together, I don't know the exact timeline of the trips, but I think in total, they spent 10 years traveling. This wasn't all at once, but still, in total, they spent 10 years traveling together, which is actually insane. Unfortunately, or fortune, I guess fortune, in 1891, Isabella's father passed away. Um, he was probably pretty old at this time, but still. So that would mean she inherited his money. I think she had siblings, but he was so wealthy. She inherited 1.75 million from her father. I ran this in a calculator, like one of those like inflation websites, and that it said this was equal to about 60 million in today's money. Like what? Your father dies and you suddenly get that much money? Like what do you do with all that? That's crazy. That's a crazy amount of money to just get. I don't really even think she worked. I think literally her whole life was just like rich people shit. Like, I never saw anything about a job. Not even for Jack. I never saw anything about him having a job. Yeah, this is literally Taylor. Like, I guess this is what Taylor wanted to be. So since she loved art, a lot of the reasons she would travel was to go look at the art of each area. And she was fascinated by all the art she saw. And this money she got led to her collecting it. She would buy it and her and Jack would take it home. So some of the art pieces she collected included the concert by Vermeer, which is a pretty important one. If not the most, this is the most important art piece in today's case. So I remember the concert by Vermeer. Very famous, worth a lot of money. Another one is Madonna and Child with an Angel by Botticelli, Rape of Europa by Titan, and King 
Philip IV of Spain by Diego Velazquez. It is a big deal. Like, a lot of the stuff she got was very... Like, this is a very famous painting. So is this one. I mean, they, they're they all very famous. They're all a big deal. Particularly in my... I'm not a huge art person, but out of all these, I feel like I re remember or, like, recognize this one the most. Botticelli. Okay, thank you. I'm not a huge art person, so thank you for that. Art people, feel free to chime in. Let's get into the of this museum because this museum's actually insane. I saw pictures of it. I'm like, oh my god. I'm pretty sure this museum ended up being, it might still be, well, maybe not since it got, stuff got stolen, but from the time of its creation and for a while, I think this was the largest, like the most expensive private collection of artwork anyone had. I'm pretty sure, if not up there. Actually insane. Like this wasn't just stuff bought by like a museum, like an organization. Like, no, this was just like one person and her husband. So by 1896, the Gardners did have a large house and they in fact extended it at some point because I think they just wanted more space for art but <laughs> they kept collecting so much stuff that they could not have any more in their house they were essentially just hoarding all of this crazy artwork so instead of like the normal thing being like you sell the art they were like yeah let's build a museum let's like buy a plot of land and build a whole museum you're honestly taking a dislike to them i think that's fair they're not alive at the time of the crime but i wanted to include this because i just found her so fascinating i was like what like this is so bizarre like she is so bizarre so they both set their sights on buying a plot of land in the Fenway area I'm pretty sure and they tasked an architect called Willard T. Sears to design the building so they they had a plan they they really just were dumping their money it's like literally instead of just downloading depop you're just like i'm just gonna build a property just to keep my clothes in that's like kim kardashian <laughs> tragically for isabella jack did pass away very suddenly from a stroke in 1898 and he didn't even get to see the construction of the museum begin but Isabella wanted to fulfill the plan that her and her husband had, so she bought the plot of land and she began construction of the museum in 1899. So she spent about four years, I think 1901 and 1902 were Isabella's big years of like decorating the house. She like furnished it, she was like perfecting it to her style. She spent quite a lot of time getting this museum exactly how she wanted it. And so it said the museum opened privately at first in 1903 it had this huge elite opening it had like the boston symphony orchestra i forget what it's exactly called but they had like a huge orchestra there like performances like again rich people sh and these are some pictures I was able to find of it. Most of the pictures I saw are of the courtyard. And I know I said rich people, but that's just stunning. Is that not like incredible? It is great Gatsby stuff, but it's it's beautiful. Like I've never really seen a museum with like a little greenhouse part. Like that's that's lovely. I also don't know how recent it is, so I'm assuming it's been like not like refurbished, but you know, they've been like upkeeping it. So let's get to the end. Let's conclude Isabella's story. Talk about how she's remembered. To the next 20 years, Isabella would continue to hold these huge events at these museums. I'm assuming, or at this museum, I'm assuming mostly for richer. It was a more elite thing. I'm thinking, especially because it gets into like the early 1900s. I'm like, this is probably a pretty elite thing to spend your time at some art museum in Boston. But she had a lot of music and dance performances because those were her favorite things she loved music and dance along with displaying her art like she was in heaven honestly like rich people you can't tell me money doesn't buy happiness because she bought her happiness but her health quickly started to decline in 1919 when she suffered a stroke and she did continue to engage with the museum during this time and she was a very dedicated philanthropist that's what they say. And she died in 1924 when she was 84 years old. So she lived a long life. Her will was $1 million. So I guess that's all she had left. She must have spent a lot of that money 
because again i don't think she had a job i think a lot of the her money she just put into the museum so of course she left a lot of money to the museum and she also donated some of her will to causes that she found important from what i saw a lot of these organizations were supporting children with very high needs a lot of organizations dealing with disabilities maybe child children who have gone through abuse so like good causes i just don't know how much money was given to each from her website and from what other people have said a lot of the stuff that isabelle is remembered for is basically just being this eccentric weird wealthy socialite and they really push in the philanthropy they really want you to remember her philanthropic efforts though i could not see how that was too influential in her life or her biography it kind of just feels like more like she just put money here and there when she had it it's not like she was active in any of these organizations but that's that's a discussion for another time there was a painting done of her i think in like this was in like 1921 by john singer Sargent. she is cool like she is cool but i'm like i'm not gonna say she's a good person but she is cool i'm not gonna deny that she's not like no she's cool like she's wild like that's why i had to put her in because i'm like this biography is insane like who gets to live a life like this like that's fascinating so yeah this was the final painting done of her where she's just really frail and sickly it's honestly kind of disturbing i don't know why she's just wrapped head to toe i maybe it's just the weird eccentric rich person i don't know maybe she just like to be wrapped in a, a blanket I, I really don't know but this was the last painting done of her that's like 2040 fashion yeah it's kind of star wars isn't it she kind of is like very star wars i think she's ahead of her time also she was like 80 something in this photo ain't no way her face looked like that i just thought i should incorporate isabella's life into this because i think it's pretty important to like know the background of this museum and like why it was built and i think it's kind of funny in hindsight that i mean a lot of art museums experience heists and theft but this one's just like crazy like of course the bizarre woman who created this bizarre museum years later would have the most bizarre art heist that maybe has ever happened here's when it gets even crazier you're gonna sympathize with the thieves i don't think you will because we we'll get into it we don't know much about them that's the thing like there's not much to sympathize with Except one thing I think you guys might sympathize with or think is funny. So, first I'm just going to give you a timeline of the crime. We're just going to talk about what happened and then we're going to get into the theories. We're going to get into the nitty gritty. So, let's just hear what happened. So, after... 1 24 a.m two men approach the security at the museum claiming to be police officers re responding to a reported disturbance now this was not that bizarre because again it was the very we more like people were still out partying and it was saint patrick's day it was saint patrick's day a disturbance is not that in boston on St. Patrick's Day is not that weird. But of course, these police officers are the thieves. So there's two of the two fake police officers. The police uniforms were fake and this was a con to get inside the museums. The first security guard, so let me let me really set the scene. So there's the door. I don't know the exact placement, but there's a security desk. There's two security guards on shift right now. One of them is sitting at the front desk and this guy's a complete idiot and we'll get into it. But this guy's at the desk and there is a panic button underneath the desk. Remember that? And then the other security guard is walking around the museum, just patrolling the rooms, making sure everything's okay. So there's two security guards on shift. The first security guard let these men in the door the men started saying stuff to him to like do we recognize you oh i think we have a warrant out for your arrest this guy was like oh they're trying to arrest me in my mind i'm like he must have genuinely think he was like oh there was like really something that i could be arrested for which i wouldn't be that surprised when we get into who this person is so he ended up radioing the patrolling guard the one who was walking around to come to the front desk because 
there were two police officers here and he's like, I'm getting arrested, so come up here. And after doing that, the two men lured him from behind the desk so he was away from being able to call for help. They pinned him to the wall and immediately handcuffed him. The other guy came in right after that and then he was immediately pinned to the wall, handcuffed. They even duct taped them and then they were taken to the basement, which is a bizarre detail and we'll get into that. They took them into the basement and then handcuffed them once more to a steel pipe that was in the basement. They were duct taped quite a lot too. They were also spread apart. I think they spread the guards 50 feet apart from each other, something crazy like that. But they even had tape around their face like their eyes were covered. I think one of them maybe had a little space where they could see through, but their whole face was wrapped. I think there's pictures of how they were found and it's quite bizarre. They were just like taped all around their head like crazy. Not like orderly or anything, but their mouths, their eyes. It was over their hair, so I can't imagine that was fun to get off. Oh, I also forgot to mention as soon as the two guys were handcuffed, the two fake police officers, the thieves, were like, yeah, this is a robbery, you idiots. I I'll get into how they were found, but just so you know, these men wouldn't be found until like seven hours later. I think the basement wasn't investigated until like almost nine o'clock, which is so long. <laughs> I know that's funny that like they just showed up they're like yo these guys are handcuffed and duct tape let's like uh, take a picture. It is crazy but I, I think there's maybe more rational reasons. This is a picture of how they were found uh which is crazy. Their ankles were duct taped, their hands were duct taped, and their face were duct taped and they were handcuffed here and I'm pretty sure they were handcuffed to a steel pipe which is crazy yeah this is how one of the guys was found and th this guy oh we'll get into this guy he's no longer alive i feel bad speaking ill on him but he is so important to today's case so we'll get into it Bruh. already bizarre and the heist hasn't even really started this is just them getting the security guards bound so they're not a problem and they also told them they're like we'll give you a reward in a year if you guys don't say anything to the police which like how that's like so weird. like because like this is like the testimony of the two security guards so like i don't think that's like suspicious of them to say but so weird they're they're literally like this and they're like yeah if you're good about this we won't hurt you and you'll get a reward in a year. They weren't hurt. They were just stuck like this for a long time, which sucks, but they did not hurt them. I don't really think they ever got a reward though, because I they did talk to authorities. Cause like kind of have to. Another fun detail, I'm not sure if this was at the beginning or the end of the heist. I'm pretty sure this was as they were like handcuffing them in the basement. So apparently one of the thieves asked if one of the guards was uncomfortable and then apologized. That detail's like so weird. I love that detail because I have like, I'll get into it at the end, but the theory that rules my heart, the theory that I have that has no evidence and I've don't think is true, but I'm like, I really just hope <laughs> that the thieves are just these two stupid dudes who are just like, who just decided to pull off a heist and then just got really lucky. That's the theory that runs my heart. That these are two idiots, no association with anyone, that just got really lucky. That's the theory that runs my heart. I wasn't going to talk about that until later, but that detail feeds into like the theory of my heart. I don't think it's true, but god that would be so funny. Because there's like a lot of reason to believe that these are not people who do art heists often. Because there's like an art to an art heist. But like these guys were just just dudes it really feels like these are just dudes who like yeah let's pull off a heist and did it and got away with like i really just hope that that's the case because that would be so funny that's the theory i choose to believe but i don't really think it's true and then there's like a 24 minute gap in the timeline where no one can really figure out what they were doing so all the video evidence was destroyed however they did have records of the security alarms so they were able to track when like an alarm was tripped somewhere so they were able to kind of detect the movement that they made during the heist but nothing was detected 
for this 24 minutes. Unless they were able to avoid the security alarms or something, we don't know. They could have just been, like, chilling. There's no testimony from the security guards that said they were really doing anything. It's just, like... Like, this this is a part that I'm like, what were they doing? Because, like, I don't know if you guys watch a lot of, like, true crime or heist or something. Usually, these types of things don't last that long. That's one of the most bizarre things about this is that this is a long crime. Yeah, they're just having a good time. That's another reason why I think this is just, like, two idiots. Because they're, do they're here for a long time. Like, usually, you're just, like, trying to get things as fast as you can. You take most crimes, like, this would take at most like a half hour but we'll get into how long this whole crime actually takes it's it blows my mind to the state that's one of the details i'm like why did they take so long and it's like they took so long and no there was like no way of authorities being contacted how in fact they could have gone for another like six hours and no one would have detected any like it's crazy so it's like really odd like you know if you know anything about crime, like, criminals don't waste their time. They're like, we're gonna get this done most of the time. But yeah, the security alarms are the main reason why we have as solid as a timeline as we do. We don't know which pieces they took first or when, but we do know when they entered in rooms so we can kind of guess. Probably talking about art, they're like, okay, which ones do we want for 24 minutes? Oh my god. At 1.54 a.m., this is the next time they're like really detected on the security alarm system. Uh, the thieves begin to steal art in the room known as the Dutch room. And this was the site of the most expensive part of this crime. It's actually bizarre how much some of this costs and why they decided to pick some. Like, some of the stuff they picked, you're like, oh, they knew what they were doing. And then some of the stuff they picked is like, why did- why? Why would you waste your time? Like, this is, like, worthless. And then they just, like, totally missed out on, like- like, they didn't get some things that were, like, right there and clearly more valuable. It's bizarre. It's like, I really wish we knew who, who did this because I really want to know why they made the choices they did because none of them make sense. Their choices make no sense. So the main target, the artist they targeted the most was Rembrandt. There were three Rembrandt paintings along with Landscape with Ob Obelisk by Govert flink who was a pupil of ram rembrandt it's rumored that they did pick that painting because they thought it was by rembrandt because it was at first credited to ram rembrandt but it was quietly given credit to one of his pupils because i think he took credit for something one of his pupils did which is not good so that's the theory that they took that painting thinking it was a rembrandt but it was actually like one of it was someone else it was one of his pupils but the concert by Ver Vermeer, I think that's what it was, which I talked to you earlier, how it was very important to this case, was the most expensive thing that these thieves stole, and it accounted for about half of the entire value of the heist. I saw that this painting alone valued at $250 million. $250 million for that one painting. And I'm pretty sure with this one, they just, they, I don't even know what they use. They don't know what tools they use, but they, a lot of these paintings were cut off the frame. Not even like neatly either. Like it was like jagged cuts and they just rolled them and took them into a car. Crazy. They just like, no care. They're like, we're just going to cut this like $250 million painting. No big deal. It's like, no big deal. Like what? That's another thing where I'm like, this is definitely uh, another thing that feeds into the, this was done by two idiots theory. They literally just like cut it with like a knife or something. Like it was definitely not something made to cut through canvas. Like it, it was like, it looked like it was, yeah, they broke the glass. Yeah, they found there was shattered glass everywhere. So yeah, they had to break the glass and sometimes i think they had screwdrivers or something they were able to get a lot of frames off the wall one of the big reasons why they cut it is they didn't want to deal with the whole frame because they just had like some car some like normal person car i forgot what kind of car it was like a toyota or something but yeah it was just some car and they wanted to be able to roll it up and just put it in the trunk and that'd be that so that's why they didn't take 
I think some of them, they did actually take it full frame and everything, but they didn't do it with everything. One of the weird things was, was a bronze goo? Is that what that's called? It was some type of, like, ancient pottery type of thing. With that one, I think they were like, ooh, that's cool. Let's take that. Like, a lot of this was just like, ooh, pretty. And then at 2.08 a.m., there is a detected security alarm in a room called the short room, and most of the pieces stolen from this room were sketches by Edgar Degas. I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. So there are five of his works, and they took a French imperial eagle that was on a flag. This was like from the Napoleon era, Napoleon era flag. They wanted to take the whole flag, but it was too hard. So they just ripped the eagle off of the flagpole and just took the eagle. Again, why? I don't know. I don't even think this was worth that much. So all the, the short room, the Dutch room, most of this heist took place on the second floor, which, which is weird. I don't know why just the second floor. And there was only one item to be found stolen from the first floor. Um, and in the blue room, they took Tortoni by Edouard Manet. I don't know how to say it. I don't know that much. Ma Monet? I don't know. Is he French? That sounds French, probably. Oh yeah, because Isabella's travels are mostly to France and Italy, so I'm assuming most of these pieces are French or Italian. Maybe a little bit of Spain. Yeah, that sounds about right. It doesn't- it's not too integral to the story. This is one thing that's perplexing. There's so many things that are perplexing about this. Why did they not take the Rape of Europa? Because I think that was definitely the most valuable thing in the museum. This is one of the things that signals that these people didn't really know what they were doing. Like, I don't think these are people that had done it. Yeah, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't think they planned this very well, but there's also a lot that signals they knew the building very well, which is really bizarre. Like, they knew the building well, and they even potentially knew the security system really well, but for some reason, maybe they didn't know the art? like, what was valuable very well, because a lot of the stuff they took was, like, relatively valueless compared to some of the other things they took and a lot of the things they ignored. But the Rape of Europa is the one that stamp stumps professionals the most. Like, why did they not do that one? I think this was on the first floor, so, like, they're like, why did you take the Tortoni but not Rape of Europa? Like, this is bizarre. It was so random, a lot of the stuff they did. That's how it felt. They had a new apartment in Great. Yeah, with their f***ing jagged cuts of a $250 million piece. What if they were trying to get some debt money? They don't want to make a big scene and knowing that stealing the lesser value paintings would give them more. But the thing is, they did steal some high value paintings, though. One of the paintings they stole was worth $250 million. I don't think it was at the time of the crime, but uh, I think around like the 2000s, it was determined to be worth like that much. So I'm assuming in the 90s, it was still probably worth like at least like a hundred something million. So they did take stuff that was worth a lot of money. So it was just seemingly really random. They like didn't know exactly what they wanted to take. So when it we're getting to the part where they leave the building and then we can get into the nitty gritty. So the alarm system does indicate that the thieves left at different times, which makes sense. I think so they were storing some things at a door and one of them was probably getting the car started, something like that. So the first one left at 2.41 a.m., the second at 2.45 a.m. And that is when the heist is considered over. The heist lasted 81 minutes. 81 minutes for a heist. That's a long time. For two people committing a crime in a huge museum? Are you kidding? Is that just bizarre to me? Like, I that is a long time. Exactly. Like, they were just like, la da 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 da. Like, I guess, yeah, they were like watching The Little Mermaid or something. I don't know. Like, it just blows me away that 81 minutes. I don't even think they were really lollygagging that much because they, they stole 13 pieces of art and in total, all those pieces of art are valued today. I think this was a, it, it was valued around like 2000 something at 500 million dollars. 500 million dollars of stuff they stole, which is the biggest 
property theft, the most like expensive property theft in America of all time. And it's the biggest unsolved property theft in the entire world. Real question though, how do you sell high profile art like this if it's stolen? We'll get into it, but there actually is quite a market for it. And there actually is a lot of people who engage in it. And there's also some other reasons you'd steal art. But the thing that, that stumps me is like they don't, these thieves didn't really do anything that would like make it worth like really set a motive for doing this like it's really hard to even establish like what was their motive for this i don't know that's the thing that's really crazy again this feeds into the theory of like i think this was just two guys who were like let's do a heist fuck it and then law enforcement did not get involved until the next morning or like this morning i guess it was the same day but like hours later so the security guards that are supposed to start the next shift arrive at 8 15 a.m and they look in the the window they see that no one's at the front desk and their first thought is that someone fell asleep so they call like the security executive or something someone who has the key to get inside and they're like where is everyone like they can't find the two security guards that were there before they realize that the front desk empty. They can't find them in the museum. So they call the police. The police arrive and they discover they went to the basement and that's when the overnight guards were discovered again like this <laughs> it is like a cartoon it is that's why it's so crazy to me so yeah they were found with the, both their hands and feet bound and they also had tape over their eyes and mouth and they took a look at the galleries and it was a total mess there were paint chips everywhere broken glass everywhere just like empty frames just like on the ground on the wall like missing stuff on the wall like clearly missing stuff they're like oh my god and they were pretty quickly like this is crazy like this is this is like we're not we're not equipped for all this like they're pretty quickly like yeah, this is one of the biggest art heists that has ever happened again that's what i was saying another odd fact about method is that some paintings were found unscrewed from the wall while others were forcefully cut off of the wall leaving part of the canvas still there and i feel like a lot of it's the tools they had i th i personally think that maybe the other frames were bound to the wall differently and maybe they just didn't have the right tools to get these paintings off the wall get the frames off the wall which again is really funny they these people are just not fully equipped to pull off something that they did but yeah i can just imagine what that scene looked like i probably would have been like flabbergasted so yeah this was quickly acknowledged to be the largest property theft ever in america and experts ended up coming to the conclusion that the thieves were familiar with the museum and where everything was which counters a lot of like the things i notice like i i watch a history channel video which was i think narrated by the guy who plays morpheus in the matrix which is pretty cool. These professionals, like these journalists and people who were like professionals on the case, they really seem convinced that whoever did this really knew the building well. And a lot of that video I watched really was trying to accuse... They really seem set that it was one of the security guards, and I don't think it is, and we'll get into that. So there's also an indication that the thieves were even familiar with like security systems and what to do to tarnish that, to get rid of evidence. Um, so they stole the videotape footage from the security cameras and like destroyed it. I don't know if it was ever found or if it was found. No, they, they probably took the whole thing. And then there was also a printout of the security alarm system. So they took the printout of that, but the History Channel really emphasized this. They were like, the thieves made one crucial mistake is that the security alarm system, like the movement, the detections is stored on a hard drive, which the thieves did not take or do anything with. And then the only other hard evidence that would, you know, 
point to a suspect would be like forensics but again this was a fail because the thieves they did leave behind footprints and fingerprints but since the museum was so visited like so many people were in and out of the museum constantly it was really hard to do anything with that because there was just so much and it was also the 90s so they it, it it just was really hard to be able to pinpoint like a solid fingerprint or a solid footprint for like any type of lead so like basically they got nothing all they have is the security alarm system. What alarm was tripped where, when. That's it. That's literally the most solid lead in this case, which is so frustrating. There's never really been hard evidence since, which is like, oh, I, I just want to know so, so bad. I just, I need to know so bad. Do you guys remember the security guard I was talking to? The one who was sitting at the front desk? All right, we're getting into him. He's a whole... He's a whole topic himself. In fact, he was the first lead suspect. Not him being one of the thieves, he was clearly not. They are suspecting that he was involved. So it was Richard Aboth, I think that's how you say it. He was 23 at the time, so very young. He was the security guard who was at the front desk who let the thieves in after being convinced to let them inside. He did immediately become a suspect for being involved, and there actually are quite a few pretty solid reasons for this. This not being one of them, by the way. Just some background on who this guy is, just to get a sense of who he is. Aboth was a music school dropout. He was in a band and he was a self-proclaimed hippie. In fact, I think he even mentioned that the day, <laughs> the day the heist happened, I think he informed law enforcement that he was supposed to see the Grateful Dead that night. So yeah, this is who we're working with. And he was not good at his job and he got away with a lot of things he was not supposed to do, frankly. He, he did not follow protocol a lot of the time. Often he would let friends into the museum. He literally admitted that he would show up to work inebriated sometimes. He was like, yeah, I show up to work drunk sometimes, but I promise not this time. Not this time. So we can't exactly rule that out because it, it was like enough time afterwards where you're not going to find a uh, alcohol in his system that long after so we'll never be able to know if he really was drunk on the job or not i honestly think it would be really funny if he was drunk on the job but that would just further play into two idiots who got really lucky because they were dealing with two other idiots aboth was not the only one who did this in fact i found out that this was a thing a lot of the security guards did but they would just let their friends into the museum after hours for like private tours and this was not allowed this was not allowed but it was something a lot of them did and aboth also in his questioning he did claim to see two odd visitors outside of the museum at closing time i don't know why he mentioned this but i think he's implying that he might have saw people who could have been that didn't lead anywhere so let's talk about the security protocol at this museum and how Aboth did not follow it. Even though the thieves were claiming to be police officers, uh, the security protocol is still like, you don't let these people inside. So if someone's demanding to get inside and they will not leave, the security guard must call the authorities, which makes sense because like if these are people pretending to be police officers or if they actually are police officers, like yeah you call them to confirm their identity like that that just makes sense that you just do a quick phone call like are these officers supposed to actually be here yes okay like come in you guys or are these officers supposed to be here no oh uh yeah you have two people impersonating officers here so that was the first f up yeah aboth did not follow this protocol one of the things was because they were able to convince him that he was getting arrested and for some reason that was a really easy thing to do to like make him think that he was being arrested to the point that he was in handcuffs and he still didn't know there was anything weird going on which is crazy so that's why aboth contacted the other guard and you know yada yada, yada. the events just happen as they did so back to the basement how did they know there was a basement how do they know that which is another thing that put a bit of suspicion on a bath and that's when we get into the one painting stole in the blue room which is a mystery we still don't understand so motion within the blue room was never actually detected during the time of the heist 
which is really bizarre. And you know, one painting was stolen from there. So that either means that they were able to avoid the security alarm or someone took that painting from there at a different time. And it just so happens that the only movement that had been detected that day was from a buff who claims that was just him doing normal protocol, patrolling around each room. But there was the theory that during this time, Aboth was the person who took the painting from that wall. Now, I don't know when he tripped the security alarm or like when he was detected to be in that room, but from what I felt, what they implied, it was quite a bit before. And if by the time he had taken like, I just don't understand how he could take it and hide it from his co-worker. Because by the time the heist happened, a boss was at the front desk and the other security guard was patrolling. Wouldn't he notice that one of the paintings was missing? Wouldn't he notice that? That's why I don't I don't really think this theory. I think the thieves just avoided the security alarm for whatever reason in this room. It is a bizarre mystery in the crime, and I don't think we'll ever know exactly what happened, but I personally don't think that Aboth has anything to do with anything. But there is a lot of evidence that does make him look suspicious. There was a point in the night where a both was it triggered on the security alarm that a both had opened and closed a door in the museum and that was not a part of security protocol protocol a both claims that he was checking to make sure it was locked which is something they found that he had never done before so what a lot of people think is why he opened and closed that door a lot of people think he opened the door to signal to the thieves that now is a good time to come in but like why would that make any sense? Like, there's not a lot of people there. I, I just don't know why he would need to signal if there's only one other person there and he if it was an inside insider thing. Like, it just doesn't make sense. But yeah, he didn't end up being cleared just because there was not a lot of, like, hard ev evidence that he had really anything to do with it. I mean, he was duct taped. This is Richard Aboth. So, I really don't think he had anything to do with anything, but he remained under suspicion for a really long time. And it came back in 2015 because the FBI released a security video showing him letting in a random man, which Aboth claims he doesn't remember. But I don't really think that really necessarily means crime. Like, does it mean he's bad at his bad at his job sure like he just let someone in maybe it was like his friend at the time or something i don't know but does it mean that he was part of like this huge criminal organization i don't think so so this is for class class participation time do you think a boss was involved personally no I don't think he was involved. Do I think he was about his job? Yes, absolutely. That is not an opinion. That's a blatant fact. This was not a very smart guy. And a lot of people, once they talked to him, once they knew more about him, they were like, I'm having a hard time believing this is some guy involved so in some criminal mastermind scheme. I understand the suspicion, that's for sure. Yeah, I get it. Um, unfortunately, he's passed away now, so we might never know. But I don't know. If you think he might be, I think that's fair. I think there's a lot of evidence that does make him look suspicious. I think... At best, he's bad at his job, and that's personally the opinion I have, but at worst, maybe he did have something to do with it, but I don't know, after this, he didn't get into- like, he had never really been in any legal trouble, I don't think. Not that that means anything, but like, he went back to school after this, he moved out of the state, went back to school, and he became like a TA, so I think this guy was just kind of too- too much of an airhead to really do anything this crazy, I don't know. But yeah, however, if you were to believe that Aboth was involved, the theory is that he was signaling to the robbers that he- when he opened that random door, and and that he was the one who stole the painting from the blue room since he was the only one confirmed to be in that room. I guess the other security guard wasn't in that room, so I guess that would make sense that he could have stolen it without the other guard noting, noticing. I guess that's possible. We'll never know. I personally don't think he was involved. I think he was just some hippie guy. He could have been used, maybe. Maybe he was offered a bit of money, maybe he needed it, I don't know. He was 23. It's possible, but there was never enough evidence to ever really confirm that. We're gonna get into the other theory. So still to this day, the information we know about the thieves and the crime is next to nothing. Nada. 
Literally, the timeline is, like, almost all we know. Where the FBI ended up being on this case, like, the Boston police were like, we, we can't do this, like, what? This is above our pay grade. So, yeah, it's some FBI agents, detectives, and even, like, the best investigative journalists, and I know I'm biased, but from what I've seen, a lot of the theories and a lot of the really solid theories come from investigative journalists. So I would like to give credit to journalists for really doing the hard work that like a lot of law enforcement was not doing. One of the biggest art heists in the country, like that's not exactly something any city police is equipped for. That is a very large scale investigation. From what I've seen, a lot of people who have know a lot of details, experts on this topic, journalists, law enforcement, art lovers, anyone just fascinated with this case. Not anyone, but a lot of these experts really believe that this was something in terms of a group effort. This would mean that the two thieves would be potentially working with a larger crime organization, which is what a lot of people believe, that these two were hired or were a part of some bigger crime organization. So yeah, since a lot of people were theorizing that this had to do with some larger crime organization, this led to questionings of many, many known crime bosses, crime bosses within the area like Boston, New England, anyone. There has never been enough evidence to convict any one of the crimes, to charge anyone with any of the crimes. There's literally been no no charges. They've gotten close, but I don't think that has ever happened. Though there is one person who admitted to at least a little involvement, and I'll get into that. So let's get into another suspect, James Whitey Bulger. So one suspect that was questioned was a mob boss named Whitey Bulger. It does not seem that Bulger would have facilitated the crime like did it hit himself, but he did become involved with the crime because he saw his own investigation because he felt that he was owed some of the profit because the heist occurred on his turf. This guy was in the Johnny Depp movie? What? I mean, I think he's a pretty iconic mob boss. He was like one of the first people questioned with this. Johnny Depp played Whitey Bulger in a movie? What? disgusting. An article in The Guardian that's really convinced on him his involvement claims that this had to do with the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. There's actually, IRA is not, is actually involved in like so many different, not so many, but like the, this is not the first mention of the IRA in this, uh, in the suspects. So yeah, big mob boss guy. The article claims that this Scottish investigator named Charles Hill, who's very set on this, very convinced of this theory. He's very set that Bulger was the center of this crime. But there is some things that do kind of make the theory make sense, but there's also a lot of things I'm like, mm. So the IRA does have a history of taking art pieces for ransom money to like get goals, but I have problems with that because he cites that as one of the main, you know, motives that the IRA would have, but like there's so many things. But his theory leads to the point that that means all of the pieces are somewhere in Ireland. Like he believes that all of the pieces, some if not all of the pieces are in Ireland, which is like why why would the ira just want these pieces just to hold on to them because i'm telling you right now spoiler alert none of these pieces have ever been found officially they've never actually been found officially none of them which is another thing where i'm like how no one has said anything which is crazy if the ira likes to steal art for ransom money why are these pieces different we've never heard anything about you know them like being like hey i have this painting give me this money you could get it back like there there's never been any terms of like that at all like oh you want this painting back like here's my money or like give me money there's no proof that anyone has it uh they've never ended up using this for ransom money like it, it just it makes no sense like i just feel like that's such a high profile 
organization that like and if their history of stealing art has been for ransom money for like political goals i just don't know why this would be different a lot of this just doesn't make sense to me i i'm just not a believer of this theory if you believe this theory that's good i'll get into a theory that i believe the most if this has to do with the bigger organization i would think that it would have to be more local I don't think Bono's involved with this at all. I think he could fully just afford to buy art. I don't think he has to pay someone to steal them. If you're more curious about this theory, there are good there is good reason to look into it since a lot of the mob in Boston was Irish American, therefore had ties to the IRA. So there that is like uh it doesn't make sense. He wrote Beautiful Day because of all the beautiful art he sold. I don't wanna blame Bono for this. For all I know, Bono has literally nothing to do with this case. And also, the detective Charles Hill, though, from what I've heard of him, I'm not a big fan, but he does have a pretty good track record in terms of his investigative journalists. He exposed quite a few things, and he ended up being right about a lot of things. He claims to have contacts giving him this information, but again, there is no hard evidence. So this is another one that was just really weird. This was like some journalist. I don't know. This story is really, really weird, and I don't believe it. Too much mobsters like known criminals i don't know if they were mobsters but they were known criminals particularly art theft so there's william billy youngworth and miles connor so youngworth is like the more important character but youngworth was already a known art thief in the area so he did become a prime suspect for the case which makes sense because like if you have a track record for art theft it makes sense to check the art thieves in the area that would make sense so oddly enough a lot of the theft that youngworth did was for his former karate teacher miles connor and connor was the one who put youngworth up to these tasks and a lot i found that a lot of the times connor would be like yo get me this piece of art connor would be in jail so like a lot of this happened while connor was in prison for what i'm not really sure but i'm sure probably like drugs I don't know. But Connor had a huge collection of stolen artwork. I don't know what he was in jail for, but for whatever reason, I guess they just never checked his house, I guess. I don't know. It's really weird. If you're, if someone's in jail that many times, you think like, especially for theft, you're like, couldn't you get a warrant to like check if they got stolen shit in their house? Cause like, it seems like this guy had a lot of stolen artwork. From all this experience Youngworth was getting, um, he ve became very connected in the web of art crime which would make him if not involved worthy of questioning because he could give leads to other people who could potentially be involved in art theft so it makes sense that he be he came involved but at the time the gardner heist youngworth was in jail and this is like he was in jail i think connor was also in jail so it's not like neither of these people were the thieves like, I literally still to this day have no idea who these thieves were, were. Like, all the theories are, like, of people who facilitated it. We're nowhere near even knowing who the thieves were. I have no idea. Yeah, they're definitely not the thieves, but the rumor was that he was part of the distribution of the artwork after the heist happened. So, like, he was helping sell it, distribute it. I don't know. And Youngworth also had connections to the IRA. I couldn't find what that had to do with this case, but he did have connections to the IRA. Now, this is where it gets weird. Um, we're still on the topic of Youngworth, but this is the the reason he became involved. Oh my god, there's an ant. <coughs> Get off my mouse! Anyways, a journalist named Tom Mashberg, who I think is full of things he wrote an article to vanity fair making some very crazy claims con regarding the missing artwork mashberg claims that youngworth himself took him to some warehouse to prove that he was in possession of 11 out of the 13 stolen pieces already like were you already suspicious expecting him were you questioning him but yeah this it's so weird to me like he's just like yeah i was just like on this road and then i was taken to this warehouse and whoa the stolen art was there like and he wrote this article himself like it's it's out there you could look it up but how did you get into this situation how like you did you already have a lead or something and you're already on him and then youngworth is like yeah come and see it I'll prove it. I got him. Now, why would you do that? 
why would a very experienced criminal do that? That makes no sense! I don't know, this whole story I think is just doo-doo, if you ask me. But he swears that he saw Youngworth himself unravel a campus and revealed the Rembrandt painting, The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. Signature and everything. That's what he claims. And allegedly, he was offering to return the pieces in exchange for the release of his friend Miles Connor. I like, I guess it makes sense, but like, why? Why wouldn't he make that note? Like, if he were trying to get, like, a, a political goal or something out of it, like, why wouldn't you do that on a bigger scale? Why would you do that through a journalist? Like, that makes no sense to me. I think he was, like, a journalist at, like, the Boston Globe or something. Like, this wasn't some, like, high-profile journalist. All right, that's that's the end of that lead. That's literally all there is. There's no more proof of that. That's literally, it's just the story. I don't believe it. Now, here's one I can get behind. This is a theory I can get behind, and this has the most convincing evidence, in my opinion. From what I know, this is the most likely theory that does give us some answers. And from what I've seen, a lot of investigative journalists follow leads with this and came to conclusions this way. Like, a lot of this information was found through journalists. So this theory kicked off when mobster Robert Garente, Robert Garente's widow, told law enforcement that her husband had given a few paintings to Connecticut mobster Robert Gentile. And when taking a polygraph test, Gentile was asked if he knew that the Gardner Museum was going to be robbed before the crime took place. He said no, but the polygraph determined that to be a lie. Listen, polygraphs cannot be admissible in court, are not the best. However, in terms of evidence, this is the best evidence we have. That's literally the best evidence we have. So every question regarding the crime in the artwork resulted in the polygraph test determining that Gentile was lying. So they were like, were you ever in possession of this artwork? He'd say no. It was determined he was lying. I know if you if you subscribe to polygraphs or not, take that as you will. But in my opinion, I'm not even that sold on polygraphs, but I'm like, this is the best evidence we have. And then they decided to end up searching Gentile's house. They did not find any of the artwork, but they did find some documents, some papers that are pretty crazy. So Gentile had been collecting newspapers that reported on the heist. And I don't know, if you guys watch like anything about like true crime or whatever, a lot of like criminals will have like clippings of their crimes either as trophies or to like keep up with the coverage of their crime to make sure they could do what they can to not get caught see what leads they're on to just be informed of how they can better get away with it so red flag they also found a paper that had typewritten all 13 art piece names it was just a list of all the names along with how much each was worth which is like why would you have that like if this guy was not involved he was obsessed everyone did end up coming to the conclusion that at that time because this happened in like the 2000s i want to say like around like 2006 people were pretty sure that he didn't currently know where they were but they were still like seemed like he had something to do with it at some point like he knew where it was at some point which is so frustrating because he probably wasn't he's not in current possession of the he probably wasn't even involved in the the like original heist he's just somewhere in the middle and that's as close as we can get but they still weren't able to get anything from it this led to gentile's son telling the police that if his father did have possession of anything it would probably be in a shed yeah yeah there was like this doesn't really matter but there was just so much to this shed he had like a false door it seemed like he was hiding something crazy i i just imagine the investigators were like oh we're gonna get him we're gonna get him but there was just an empty plastic container in there. 
but they were informed that there was a storm um which potentially destroyed whichever whatever was in the shed and he said he had never seen his father so upset distraught um but yeah it was never enough to convict of any crimes um so yeah i think this is the most convincing theory it doesn't explain much but i think he was involved somehow i think this guy was definitely involved at some point i think he knew where the artwork was at some point but i don't know he was very much set on he was like i'm not a snitch I'm not a snitch. But a lot of the mob theories are kind of boring, but if you're more, uh, if you're curious about it, looking into any more potential connections to the case, just look up these names and then like Gardner Art Heist. There was the Merlino crime family, Robert, Robert, Robert Luisi Jr., George Reisfelder, Leonard DiMozio. Mobs are usually more professional maybe but this guy was pretty professional these these are all people who had connections to gentile like he this guy was connected with a lot of people it's it's really hard to figure out how this web applies to this crime they would get the most valuable work that's what i'm saying i don't think he was like facilitating it i don't think he was involved at the beginning and i don't think he was involved to the end i think this gentile was just involved somewhere in the middle like he had the pieces at some point and then sent them off he was involved somewhere in the middle um and then last let's end off on my my final funny theory the theory that rules my heart is what i call the lone wolf theory i d i really don't think this is true i don't think you guys should believe this but it would be really funny if this is what happened so in my heart i believe that these are just two idiots who got really 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 lucky and you know there are some details that do allude to it richard aboth and the other security guard were both really young they were both in their early 20s and they were inexperienced they were just you're in your early 20s like you're a kid like you're in your early 20s like you're kind of still like immature you're not gonna be the best security guard let's just say that um so i think the thieves are one lucky that those were the security guards that night and they were also really terrible at their jobs so again number two they came across security guard guards that were just terrible at their jobs and you know what i i don't I've never seen a, filag a fake police uniform that's actually that convincing. Like, are you kidding? You're telling me that, that you had a fake police uniform so convincing that you got inside an art museum? I mean, again, these security guards are bad at their job, but like, considering that a both admitted to showing up to work drunk before, potentially, maybe a both was so not good at his job and drunk at work that he saw these dudes and was like oh yeah the police they're here to arrest me yeah that's right so we can't rule out that a both was or wasn't drunk yeah i think a both is probably a good guy i mean he he's unfortunately passed away kind of recently but literally after this he became like a teaching assistant he got his, he finished his degree and became a teacher he was in a band he was gonna see grateful dead that night like how bad of a guy can this be he's he's not the brightest he's not good at being a security guard but he seems like a fine guy like i don't really think that again i don't think this is a criminal mastermind i think a boss just really fucked up and i kind of feel bad for him that he got he's still blamed to this day like a lot of people are really convinced that he was involved but i don't, I don't think he was again the artwork they stole was entirely random like i think these are just two guys just grabbing to be like "Ooh, that's cool again it was saint patrick's day they could have been drunk themselves they probably weren't they're actually pretty smart in the way they talk to the security guards so i don't think they were drunk yeah they took some pieces that were relatively worthless and ignored some paintings that were just incredibly valuable it's just so weird but they did take some things that were incredibly valuable doesn't really seem they really knew what they were taking it seems like they were just taking um and they also cut the canvas in a really messy way like it kind of looked like it was shredded by like a wolf from what i've seen so it kind of implied they did not have the right tools or really know what they were doing and I don't really think they had done an art heist before, I don't know. 
But that's the theory I'm gonna leave off on. Here are the sources. I don't know. What does class think? What what theory do you believe in? Because personally, I mean, the, the lone wolf theory is the theory of my heart. But personally, I think it's something in the New England mob. There is a, a journalist. I don't remember his name, though, that he has written a book on his theory. And he thinks that the paintings are buried somewhere in Connecticut. So I don't know. It's possible. It could be anything. It could be a theory that's not any of these theories. We don't know. There's, like, just not that many details, and there's not really been that many, like, leads or updates or, like, any anything that really points to us being closer to an answer. It's, like, one of the biggest mysteries, and probably will be one of the biggest mysteries in American history. I don't think it'll ever be. There's- no, there's no conclusive evidence. I don't- you don't believe polygraphs? I don't really either, but that is literally the best evidence we have in terms of figuring out what happened. That's literally the best we have.